he died. We need to figure out the stream. Awesome. Um, okay, so right here, you all can hear me, see me. Excellent. I'm Jenny Morse, for those of you who don't know me. Uh, and I teach business writing here at CSU. So my office is across the street, uh, which is super convenient. And I also have a company called Appendance, where I provide a business writing training to corporations all over the country, maybe world. <laughs> we'll see how the proposal the company in India goes. Um, really exciting, not part of the presentation, but I do have the paperback of my book. Oh, which I printed for the first time this week. Yeah, it's tiny. It's supposed to be just a little, little guide, but it is illustrated by John Garvey, who's a member of our small business community. And so um, his illustrations are in here in color. I brought two, if you want to look at them. They're fun to look at. And if you'd like to buy one, they're 15 bucks. <laughs> um, illustrations color yes i'm looking at the size of the binding how thick is it yeah it's it's tiny <laughs> yeah, it's tiny good but it's color um for the illustration so which are awesome right. it's thicker than a children's book that's printed in <laughs> all color nice. and across the door. all right so this presentation top five tips for better emails is one that I did a webinar session on, uh, I think two weeks ago now, that had 22 people at and is where I got asked to send the proposal to India. So yeah, awesome. That was super exciting. Um, in this presentation, we're just doing top five things that you can do to make your emails better. So this is for any kind of professional message that you're sending, who are you writing to, right? Why are you writing to them? It's not necessarily targeted towards like marketing or sales messages, so it can be persuasive. It can be internal or external audiences, so um, just guidelines for making it easy for people to read, respond, see what you're doing. All right, so our very first thing is that you should have a greeting. <laughs> All right, the greeting is where you say hello to people. It's where you open up your um, conversation. I think of email as a very slow written conversation. Okay, so it's a conversation because there's still this back and forth. It's just happening much slower than in person. And you can't, or you shouldn't, just walk up to people and start talking at them. <laughs> right? We usually have some sort of acknowledgement before of their existence before we start talking. So you should st also start your email conversations with a greeting. Uh, the most important thing for a greeting, research shows that 60% of people feel best about a greeting that starts with a greeting word or phrase plus a person's name. So you need both those parts. Um, I work with people who do various things, but a lot of engineers will only use people's names. <laughs> They're like, I said your name, that should be sufficient. Just, just think about how that feels when you get called out by somebody. Somebody is just like, you know, Dane, Andrew, Pete, right? Like, what? What did you need? Where, where am I looking? It's sort of abrupt or shocking. So we don't want to do that in our email conversations. We don't want to do that in person either. The saying hello is how you get their attention. The saying their name is, yes, I'm talking to you, mm -hmm. right? So those two parts. Mm -hmm. um, the other piece is that if you don't have a person's name or a name for the group, it feels less personal. So if it just says, hi, good morning, good afternoon, were you talking to me or are you just hoping somebody responds? <laughs> so we want the two pieces together. And this is the, the greeting is the first part of the email message that people hear in your voice. So it really sets the tone for the message. It affects how people are going to hear the rest of the conversation that you're having with them. So these are some of the kinds of greetings that we see. Like dear is very formal. So you use the title and the last name. Um, good afternoon, you can use. Good morning, good afternoon. If we were British, we would say good day, but we're not. So no. <laughs> doesn't matter what time it is. Good morning, good afternoon, both work. And then most common is hi. Um, hi is going to be the least formal that you are allowed to go in professional messages. So we do not use hey or hey there. Hiya. <laughs> okay, none of that. Now, you can use it with people that you know. 
but this is professional messages where you're trying to establish trust and credibility with people and you don't know what the other person's formality level is so you don't want to go in like so many marketers do with the hey there and you're like i don't know you why are you talking to me we want to start developing trust with people by meeting them wherever they are we don't know where they are so the high, more formal you start, the easier it is to come down to meet somebody. If you start too informal, there's no going back up. That's just the way that trust works in our brains. Things you will notice about the punctuation up here. I'm just showing you that a colon is the most formal. When you use a colon on the greeting, it's like, stay over there. Right. Um, so we see deer with a colon on messages from like your bank. <laughs> Okay, credit cards, loans, anytime you've messed up anything. <laughs> we usually see the greeting end with the comma, which you can think of as sort of like a one arm pup. Okay, so like, hey, what's up? And you will notice that good afternoon has two commas, and those two commas are very important. Without this comma, you are calling Mallory a good time, which is absolutely not professional. Okay. <laughs> So there's there's another joke I can make about this. It's easier when I have a whiteboard that I can write on. But if you imagine the sentence, good morning, staff. That is an inappropriate sex joke. I think it's also an joke. Um, that you can't say good morning, staff, comma. That's not okay for work. Okay, I'm not gonna explain that to you. You're gonna figure that out. Good morning, comma, staff is perfectly acceptable. So the important part is, we must have a comma in writing between what you are saying, good morning, and who you are saying it to, your staff. You always have to have that comma. Technically, there is a comma here between hi, Mallory, okay? Hmm. Grammatically, comma goes there. Nobody uses it. I mean, some people use it, and I use it with some audiences and not with others because I know, but not everybody knows, right? Why doesn't that one matter? Because hi spelled this way, only has this meaning. So it can't mean anything else. Where good and afternoon have other ways that they can be used. So without this comma, there's different meanings that happen. Here, there's no different meaning. Okay, so you can go ahead and keep using hi or hello without an extra comma. If you put it in, it's like, I know grammar. <laughs> That's what you're saying. If you don't use it, like, don't judge me. <laughs> but this one, we all have to learn to do. And I will just throw in here, when you write happy birthday, mom, there's a comma. When you say congratulations, friend, there's a comma, okay? Whatever you're saying and who you're saying it to, commas. If you read novels, you see it. If you don't read novels, you don't. All right, second thing is what comes after the greeting? A lot of people start their actual message so after the greeting with something that I refer to as the nicety. The nicety is like where you say the nice thing to them. Oh, you're doing well, or, you know, how are you? By getting these messages from the assistant to a government representative. And every single message, she has, hi, Jenny, how are you? We're just trying to schedule a meeting. So she's asking, how are you? Every single time. I've never answered. I don't know her. And I'm trying, she's just the assistant to the rep that I'm trying to schedule the meeting with. It's like, why are you asking me this? <laughs> um, so many people put some kind of nicety, mm. like hope you're doing well. What happens is that is not useful to the reader. Okay. <clears throat> so we're saying hope you're doing well or how are you? Because that's a normal way to start a spoken face-to-face -face conversation where we still don't care about the answer. <laughs> but it's a normal thing to say. And so people start their emails with that. But when you receive a message from somebody that you don't know and they're not standing in front of you, they don't have to read your whole message. So what they need to know first is why do you want my attention or why do you deserve my attention? What is the purpose of this message? Your purpose has to go first. So in this example, I have like, oh, you're doing well. Could you send me the signed contract? What is the purpose of the message? It's could you send me the signed contract? But the person starts with hope you're doing well, which is not related to the business thing. And if I don't know you, hope you're doing like, why, why are you doing that? What do you need? 
Okay, so we don't want to put the nicety first. You can write it first because that'll make you feel good. <laughs> and then move it to the end of your message. So you can write it first because that's how you like to start a conversation, but to make your message actually reader oriented so that it's useful to the other person, you want to move that to the end of the message. So they see the purpose first and then they see that you're nice. <laughs> right. But what, what is the nicest thing we can do to people when we write? Keep it short and make it easy for them to do whatever we're asking. And that is the nicest thing you can do. So saying nice things, they can't hear you, they can't see you, it doesn't have the same effect that it does face-to-face. -face. The nicest thing in writing is to make it easy for them to do the thing we want them to do. Yes? If you have a relationship with somebody and you really care about them, it's different. Yes. You gotta know. Right. These are business. But these are business messages where you... Thank you. Yeah. Do you have a question? Yes. Um, I heard that there's actually research that how a woman writes a message is different than a man. Like a man wrote from a woman's email the way he would normally write and got the response of like, that was very harsh, but it was how he normally wrote them and never received that response. But yes. Does this matter in the nicety business? Um, it can, but mostly no. Like the this particular part, most people are writing it because they want to be nice, but the way that it's received, it doesn't have that effect. So as long as it's in the message, you're going to be perceived as nice, but it, having it first, it detracts from the focus orientation. There's other things, like there's so much stuff about gendered language use. And what I find fascinating about it is that you can play into or against, right, those things as long as you know what the perceptions are. For example, not in here. I tell people, you wanna to try to take out of your writing only really very and just. And these are modifiers that we use when we talk a lot, only really very and just. Those are used more frequently by women. Okay. So in the research, more, more frequently by women, not only by women, but more frequently. And what we use them for, they're intensifiers usually. So we say, I just wanted to let you know, which diminishes, right? We're trying to make smaller our request or our demand for your attention. I was only checking in, right? We're trying to make it smaller. Um, really and very, we're usually trying to show more enthusiasm, but they're ways of navigating the perception of our demand. And in writing, just ask. Right? I just wanted to let you know makes it smaller and is a complete waste of space. You haven't actually said anything useful yet. Just ask. And if you're asking with a question mark, that tone is already nicer than I just wanted to. Yeah. So it has more to do with <laughs> what did Chris say? He said, I always write, I'm just, I'm just checking in. And then he's holding it. So. Just wanted to check. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Lots of people do that. Avoid it. We know you just wanted to check in. Start with about what? So my experience in working in larger organizations where it was pretty much all men, it was always very direct. No, well, I didn't even have it. I'd say, you know, I'd start with the first name of the year because we're all most of the time I didn't know them, but I had to communicate something and never hope you're doing well, never anything like that. So okay. it's just Strictly business, and I found it worked pretty well. And it is cultural. It depends on the organization and the, the people that you're working with. And that that culture varies. It can be organizational culture, but it's also HR people are far more likely to say, hope you're doing well than engineers, right? Except me. <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, but, but I broke up a lot of rules. generally, right, generally. And so we have those kinds of cultures. What we're thinking about is if I'm writing to somebody I don't know, what's the best way to show that they can trust me and to develop that relationship with them? What's going to get me the opportunity to work with them? Um, and then once, once you are going back and forth, you can read the things that they are doing and respond equally. So if they're using hey as they're greeting, you can use it back. If they're putting emojis in their writing, you can use it back. 
I don't have a chat up on my three screen. Minutes. What about following up with a non-client who I want to become a client? Hello, Renee. Do you have the three thousand dollars to get started? <laughs> <laughs> no emojis. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. That's. It's asking for what you want. All right. <laughs> There is a difference, this is a longer class, but there's a difference between direct and indirect approach. So the very first thing that goes in your message, you're gonna, this is from the other presentation. You start, does, does Rena know that she's on in the middle? I was gonna say, Rena's gonna make me spit my water the whole out. Chat. <laughs> All right, you, you, you ask the question first if it's a normal thing to ask, like it's part of their responsibilities, it's something that they do every day. You can start with that request. If it's persuasive, hello, Renee, do you have three thousand to get started? That's a persuasive message. You can't start with the purpose. You start with the explanation. Like we talked, here's what this investment is. Here's what the outcomes are going to be. And then you end with that request for the thing. But that's a different class. This slide was only about whether you should say something nice first. You should not. I'll type the nice thing first, move it to the end. All right. How we're using I in our message. The way that we use pronouns, and I mean like I and you, or we, they, um, indicates our relationship to each other. So when we're having a conversation, I is the speaker and you is the listener, right? So I, I say, I'm gonna say something to you. And that establishes our positions in the conversation. And then when you talk, you use I, and you use you to refer to me. Okay, this is one of the hardest things for children to learn. Um, one of my students had a little brother who thought his name was you until he was about three and a half years old. That's what everybody like. What's your name? You. <laughs> That's how conversation works, right? You is the receiver of the conversation, and it changes. But remember, email is this slow written conversation, so we're still using I and you to frame the conversation, but it's slower. So the I is holding all of the speaking time in the email. And this means that when we write, if we're using a lot of I, we're showing the reader that we're only thinking about ourselves. We have to pay attention to how we're balancing the use of I and you throughout the message so that it feels like a conversation to other, to the person who's receiving it. So we want to use I in our written messages for actions that we have taken, okay? Like I called the client on Tuesday or actions that we will take. So you're using I to say, I have done this, I will do this. Those are good uses of I because they tell us what you're responsible for. What things have you completed? What things are you working on, okay? What we don't want to do is use I, this always makes me a little bit sad, but um, using I for thoughts or feelings. I know, I think, I believe. These are normal things to say in conversation, but they are not useful in writing because you are the writer. The entire message is already what you know and think and believe. Okay. So we try to avoid I for our thoughts and feelings. And things like, I was hoping you would help me out. This is a strategy for asking somebody for help that we would use it, that we could use in conversation. I was hoping you would help me out. The reason I say it as a statement is because face to face, then I stop talking. And I stop talking is the signal that you're supposed to respond to that statement. But in writing, there isn't a pause. If I say, I was hoping you would help me out, there's no, it's called a rhetorical strategy, right? There's no thing that happens where I can wait for your answer. I was hoping you can help me out is just an idea in my head. Until I ask you, I haven't actually structured the writing to get a response from you. So we have to say things like, would you be able to help me with this? Question mark. That works in writing, where this doesn't get a response in writing as much. Or I was wondering. Um, I was wondering if that's happening in your head. Nobody has to respond to that. In conversation, you would stop talking and they would be like, oh, that was a question. All right. And then present tense actions like, uh, oh, sorry. I'm just reminding you that 
I am doing this thing right now. No, you're not. Email is asynchronous. <laughs> okay. You wrote it. Your reminder has already passed by the times people have received it. So we want to frame present tense actions as their past tense actions or future actions. And anything that's framed as a present tense needs to be about the reader doing stuff. Most common one actually is things like, I'm attaching the document. No, you're not. By the time I read it, it's all, it better already be attached, right? <laughs> so the frame for isn't I'm attaching, it's attached is or here is, because that's from the reader's perspective instead of my perspective as the writer. Okay, so I can be used for actions you have taken or will take, no thoughts or feelings, no present tense. I used to be a creative writer, and some of this stuff hurts me. <laughs> Oh, creativity. But yeah. I would counter that the more clearly you write, the less work you have to do as a result. And that's why. Yes, that's what that was. Why the way I kind of structured it, because I realized if I wasn't clear about stuff, I had to go answer a whole bunch of questions. Yeah. It's like, okay, this is it. Think, 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 think. It was really clear. No emotion. Bam. And, and I got response, which was great. You're trying to make it easy for other people to do their exactly. jobs. And me too. I mean, it was selfish. But and creative that, writing people choose to read your work work emails and are either you opening your work emails in the morning like let's see who wrote to me and what i'm doing <laughs> no we're just like what is it <laughs> what do you need what do you want so that's what all these strategies are coming from all right so number four how do you present deadlines to people um deadlines uh are so we often want to use things like urgent ASAP, now, immediately, but all of those words are relative. What that means is that that changes. Okay, so what's immediate for me is different for you, and especially an email where we're writing to each other. Now has no meaning in an email. None. Because now from the writer, it's very different to now from the, for the reader. Okay, so we have to use concrete dates and times. You have to be specific. I need it done by Friday. I need it done by three o'clock. I need it done by, okay, so we have to use the specific time. Now, immediately, ASAP, urgent, none of those work. All right, like submit it by 2.17 at 4 p.m. The other, avoiding any kind of urgency, um, all caps, don't yell at people, exclamation points, no. Okay, you're, you only get one exclamation point per professional message anyway. Yeah. So don't use it on the deadline. It doesn't make anybody feel good. The best thing you can do is put the deadline in the subject line. So remember the greeting is where you start the conversation. It's the first thing people hear in your voice. The subject line comes before the greeting. If you put the deadline in the subject line, it sounds to the reader like the universe set the deadline, right? Or the computer set the deadline. Not you, because they haven't heard you yet. The deadline is just like the robots. This is how the world works. But so you put the deadline in the subject line, and then you restate it in the body of the message, but they already heard that that was the objective rule of the world. Wow. The other thing, too, on, on because it's not really deadlines, I guess it's a more topic one. You're going to talk about that or subject line, right? I don't think that's in here. Okay. No, we, I'm sorry. Are you going to talk about the subject line? Like when you go into the inbox, can you talk about that? No, line? we have one more tip. And it's not that's not it. That's not it. Literally. <laughs> um, I think subject lines were in the other presentation. Oh, oops. and they're in the book. Oh. You're the wrong one. And they're in the class. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> when you do, you know, top five, there's there's very little that you can cover. All right, and then formatting. In terms of formatting, this is again, nobody wants to read your messages, right? <laughs> Fundamental principle of business writing. No one wants to read anything. If you start there, then everything else makes sense. Nobody wants to read your messages. So formatting is really important because people don't read. 100% of your message. You know this. <laughs> now we want to think about 
research on how people read so that we can design messages that make it more likely for information to be in the places where they are likely to look. So white space becomes really important. A thing that you probably have never thought about is that we have two ways of creating paragraphs, and you know both of them. Yeah? How are paragraphs created in a novel? Indenting, and how are they created in an email? Space. And why are there two different ways? It's easier to read in space. Mail doesn't need to. But why? Who decided? Mark Schreiner, <laughs> what is the difference between reading a novel and reading your work email? You want, you want to read a yeah. novel. <laughs> so the indented paragraph is because it's less work for your eyes. It signals a new idea and you don't have to work very hard to go there. It's four things that people are choosing to read. White space between the paragraphs instead of the indents is for things that people are not choosing to read. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so the more white space, the more um, that you have like gaps between paragraphs, the more landing places you're creating for people's eyes. So as we read, right, brains are taking in patterns. So we look at um, the pattern of the page, the pattern of the text, and then brains go to places where those patterns are disrupted. So white space is creating different landing points in the field for your eyes to go, what's over there? What's over there? What's over there? All right. The research shows that people are only going to read the first half of the first line of each paragraph. That's what they can be counted on to read. So as you're skimming, think about skimming, you're skimming down the left side, usually. So you count on people to read the first half of the first line of each paragraph. For that reason, never send one giant block of text. Because if you only have this one giant block of text, people can't skim down the side. They just read, I've gone through all emails sent to me since I left yesterday, and they're like, this is the worst email I've ever read, delete, right? I've gone through all the emails sent, this is a real email, I changed all the names, but these are things that I actually find in the world. I've gone through all the emails sent to me since I left yesterday. Why on earth are you telling me this, right? I assume that you went through your emails, that's your job. What happens later in the paragraph, nobody ever reads because it starts with this narration of her job responsibilities. Delete. All right. <laughs> what we want to do, and I took the same text, is create landing places using bold works really well for drawing people's attention. Bullets work very well for um, drawing attention. And then I like to use asterisks around words in the middle of things because it changes the um, formatting a little bit. So you're thinking about how can I make something interesting for people to look? Because you're not going to be able to get all of the most important information into the first half of the first line of each paragraph. There's going to be other information later in the paragraph or in other sentences that you need them to look at. And so bold bullets and asterisks are really good ways of drawing the eye. You'll notice that underline and italics aren't in here. They do not draw the eye in the same way. So they only work to create emphasis if people are already reading. And our work messages, we're assuming that nobody wants to read them, so they're not reading. <laughs> All right, so if we take the same content and redesign it, for example, you can see like schedules for our two social media director candidates are being finalized. Here's Kim's schedule, here's Elizabeth. This was all in here. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Elizabeth's schedule. Sign up sheet is attached. Please email me with your preferred times. Okay, so I didn't even read the whole thing and I know what needs to be there. And then you can fill in other pieces of information. So how we design our messages based on the research we have about how people don't read um, is really important for getting our messages across. So now there are our top five. Enter your preferred so time on this sheet. <laughs> I gotta tell you, um, for many years I wrote like that essentially. And it was really hard for me to go back and read, create writing. Because <laughs> I was yeah. so focused on the format. I was like, it's like, wait, where's the board? There's there is a yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There is no purpose. It's for pleasure. <laughs> right. It was just an interesting observation. It's like, wow, I guess you're too good at that. So yeah, yeah. they're totally different. Um, so I don't think that QR code will work for you or you, the discount won't work for you anymore. This is an old presentation, but, <laughs> well, 
if you sign up. The next session runs right. April 11th. Which you can't. Right. <laughs> that QR code won't take you to, but attendance.com. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. We should clap. Oh, Thank you for your attention. Yes. Did it? Is there a question though? Yes. <clears throat> when you're sending out to a group of people, should you address it to the person who's reading it or to the group of people? Oh, good question. Um, depends on how you've done the two and the CC. So if it's two people and other people are CC, then you write to the two. If the group is all in the two line, so they're they all have equal weight, then you have to name the team. So I have a committee, for example. So I say hi, content members or hi, content folks. Um, so people do like hi, purchasing department, whatever it is. You write the name of the group. Don't forget the comment. Don't forget the comment. <laughs> avoid, avoid the word. Uh, <laughs> so if you're saying it to one person, send it to one person. If you're sending it to a group, then you name it to group. Yeah. Hey, um, organizers. Yes. So I, I, I could, you could probably use plenty of my emails as examples of what not to do. Um, what are your thoughts on when I have a lot of information to send? Mm -hmm. uh, so describing my program, this is something I've been doing lately, right? Here's all the information about my program in an email, like it's informational versus like, how do I send that information? Otherwise, do I PDF it? And so now they have a document to open and by having an attached PDF, does that imply that, oh, I want to read that thing versus an email, I don't want to read this. Yeah, so email, I mean, we think about this all the time, right? So that's a good question. Email, if it's longer than one computer screen, so we're used to scrolling down on our phones, but if, it's, if I can't read the whole message on my computer screen, we're unlikely to read it. So if you're putting a lot of information in there, people aren't going to see it. Now, Sometimes I work with people who are like, and that's a good thing because I just wanted to let them know stuff, but I don't actually care if they read it, like policies, procedures at big companies. If I'm responsible for sending it out so I can hold you accountable for it, but whether you read it or not, right, it's like the law. <laughs> the cop can pull you over, whether you know all the words or not, or the rules or not. Okay, so how do you do this? You can do an attachment. I do links because I put in like the top couple of things that they need to know, right? For, for my program, I put in like, it's six weeks, it runs here, right? Um, this is when the coaching is. And then I have a link to the landing page that goes through all of the stuff in the program. And then you know if they read it. Right. Yeah. Not only that, but you can also update it. Right. And can't update attachment. Right. It's linked. Okay. So even if they've asked for information, you still don't, at all in your email because the nature of how we read email yeah. it's you're supposed to be able to figure out at a glance what the person needs from you and so if it's a lot of the outcomes and the, all of that has to be separate yeah. is there some sort of in between in that where you can put like the most important things from the PDF, like just a little bit and then like read more here yes so that was that's what i was saying i usually put in a couple of bullets about the most important information and then you can find more here right so how i often structure it in my messages is i'll have one sentence with a link in it and then three bullets underneath top things and then if i'm selling you know my program and a seminar then there's another full sentence about the seminar with a link in it and then sorry and just the you things about a link it's the marketing right here is like that then tracks into your CRM tracking system. So you get a little alert like Charles just opened your like sales pitch and, and clicked your proposal. Yep. Check it out. Look how interested they are. Ben has a question too online. Oh, okay. Ben, go ahead. Hey, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Hey. I uh, just wanted to say, Sean and Jenny, this is fantastic information. Thank you for sharing. And and also thank you for stepping up for anyone not aware. I think Leandra covered it, but our normal presenters had to cancel. One was sick and I don't remember what happened to the other, but thank you, Jenny, for, for stepping up. <laughs> Um, she was the other one. She was the other one. Oh, I'm. But so, I was just going to do six minutes. So. so so yeah. So for I I missed you all last week at Founded and Foco. Um, 
thanks to everyone who, who presented and supported that effort. I, I've been dead to the world for the last week with COVID. Um, the, the only thing I, I wanted to comment is like, it's from for someone who was in the corporate environment and got regularly 200 to 300 emails a day, I will, will completely admit that I would be one of those people that read the first half of the first line and then hit delete if it was something that was unintelligible. So like, it goes along like these five tips alone would go a massive distance in helping your content get get read and digested. So there's huge value here. And I'd, I'd recommend anybody that's anywhere in the business environment to take advantage of this and anything else that Jenny's offering. Because from someone who's been in that environment, this is insanely valuable. So thank you for sharing. Thanks, Ben. Can we turn that into a testimonial? I know. <laughs> and then I will post that on my website. <laughs> Yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> like I've been, uh, arm is sore. So two things. One, you got a shout out from Sally about your yes. your class. Yes. So make sure everyone aware of that. Go to SBDC, Larimer County SBDC to sign up for the classes you offer through that organization. Second thing I have was if you put a link in your email, if you put it too early on, are you are you afraid that someone's just going to click on the link and not even read the rest of it? You should design it so that that both doesn't happen and isn't a problem. <laughs> Your email should be short. It's a point. I don't usually put it in the very first thing because the very first thing is the purpose of the message, right? Where, so like Dean and I are doing these, here's the information on my course that you asked for. I would just put that first. Here's the information on my course. Okay. And then I'd have links and bullets throughout the message. So you respond to the request, right? Or whatever the request you, request you are making. So, so if you're asking them to do something, you put the, I'm asking very clear, this is what I want you to do. And here's the supporting information to get it done. Yeah. Okay. yeah. And remember links, because they're blue hyperlink usually, those are going to draw the eye too. Right. So when you think about how you're designing stuff, you want the links to be not the first half of the first line of each paragraph. You want it to be later or in multiple lines so you can draw their eye. When we're drawing the eye, we're drawing the attention. And that makes people read more. And there are other strategies for making people read more that are not in here, but they are super fun and they have to do with grammar. <laughs> <laughs> Come to another class. Same, yes. <laughs> you know, new people are going to be like, we're not asking. <laughs> um, so I, I find working with uh, engineers up to CEOs, like the messaging and the attention span gets shorter and shorter and shorter. And when I ask a CEO what I, what they would like to see change when I'm coaching a new manager, they're like, we want them to tell us what they need quickly. Yes. And it's all communication, right? I know. We've, we've I've talked about already. it. Yes. It's a brilliant idea. Dan's trying to convince me. Yeah. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> um, and, and so I, these new managers are trying to use an email to convey information. But the people they're sending information to only want the email to know what action they made. They don't need the whole backstory. And this is so that those engineers, right? When I counsel them on this stuff, they're super smart and they care a lot about what they're doing. Yeah. And they wouldn't just um, like I also belong in this category. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like people who know too much about the particular thing and want everybody else to know all the things that they know. Sorry. And so they write their messages like and this and this, and nobody else cares. Right, so I go through the top five tips and I'm like, this is just surface level of all the things that I know. That's how the engineers feel. And you go, okay, you need to write it in a way that that person gets exactly what they need. That's what these techniques are for. And you can pull whatever you want in an attachment. <laughs> there you go. And it's design, learning to design, what does that person need versus what do I want to tell them? What they need goes in the email. What I want to tell them goes in the attachment. Mm -hmm. Ben wants to say one more thing, but he has to keep it short because it's 9.50. All right, Je Jenny basically just said what I was going to say. It's, it's Dane, if, if I could add or like give some direction there, it would be like to help those people realize that the communication is not about them. It's about who they're sending it to and get them to empathize if possible 
with that person's needs versus what they want to say. So that, that's all. That's what they learn in my six week program. <laughs> <laughs> Which can be found. Yes. Well, that link will take you oh, to it. A discount code. Yeah. So you guys showed up a little bit late, and I think that you're very tight. Okay, so I just wanted to tell you that normally what happens is that we have two six minute presenters and we give them feedback, but our other, Jenny was going to give us a six minute presentation, but our other person was sick and she can just rock a 30 minute thing. So we let her rock it for us. So it's not always like this. I just want to let you know that. Um, but thank you, Jenny, for usually we get coffee in the middle. You get coffee in the middle. Yeah. We required you to stay awake and pay attention through her whole presentation <laughs> without a second cup of coffee. So great job. We usually don't interrupt as much either. That's true. We don't interrupt six minutes. Um, but we can't be held back beyond six minutes. <laughs> um, so who has a win that they want to share? Who has a resource that we should know about? And who needs help? So the first help ask is, I think we have one or two on March meeting. Possibly one, possibly two. I think just for one, the email. Just one. Okay, because there was talk about a switcheroo. Yeah, yes. yeah I'm, I'm so maybe, not sure, sorry. I'm, I'm playing catch up. I know there's at least one spot open on the 29th. Okay, and then we have, if you would like to present, we've got spots in April and you can reach out to Natalie to get on our schedule. She does a great job of keeping our pipeline filled. Great speakers. So back to who has a win, who has a resource, who needs help. After like a month of marketing and LinkedIn messaging and posts and stuff, um, everyone's kind of ignored my targeted marketing team uh, things, but I posted a picture of the gift box that I'm gonna send yes. to, to new uh, participants. And someone I, I knew seven years ago, liked the post, submitted my form on my website, and then we had a conversation the next morning. And resulted in two proposals for two different things. So one person for the program and then him just custom executive coaching. So those proposals went up and now it has to go through the final Dude, That's Dane, that box looked legit, man. Well, well that? done. Well oh, done. Yes. That box looked legit. That, yeah. was, that was great promotion. I started thinking about what I was going to do. Right. I met this guy at church and he designs product packaging. I was like, hey, do you want to make a box for me? I did, I did tease you about fresh coffee right. and like super cool. I never bragged too much about isolation. <laughs> <laughs> it was coffee there. I was like, do double, do double. <laughs> but yes, I, I think Candace would say, Candace Keelan would say, you kept it human and that's what got the engagement. So way to go with that. What else? Who else has a win? Who else has a resource that we should know about or needs help? We had a meeting with the Bruce Duke car wash guy. Yes, I was like, and, I yeah, yeah, they do yeah. a really good job with onboarding and showing, teaching leadership to their employees and stuff. We just wanted to learn more. And after that, he sent us to uh, one of his managers and they're going to have us give them a few quotes for the love and locations for landscaping. <laughs> wow. you know? So that's a great connection. Yeah. Uh, and he wants to like come and motivationally speak to our employees when our staff is full. Justin, the, the guy that we met the first time. So it's a really kind of neat, supportive thing They're to happen. Yeah. 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 We should have Cheyenne. So we have them. Natal, I was just going to say, Natalie's yeah. not on, but we should have her reach. Yeah, and, and, and Justin's just. Oh, we weren't looking yeah. for the work. Right. No, I know. For just guidance on growing a business. and. Right. In a small entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial business in yeah. Colorado, and next thing you know, they're like, check out these workers. Yeah, that's how it was. I also talked to the part of that. <laughs> she is, yeah. Yeah. That's the idea. Yeah. Let's yeah. 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 each other out. You know, they start yeah, I mean, if you talk to somebody so. who's basically the same ship, yeah. And especially if they're not asked soliciting, yeah. you yeah. know, that always tends to be more. More, more effective. Well, right. it's a ring with people. Mary and Brian, okay. Great. Turf tamers. Okay, so I actually met them and she was saying we want to help our employees like start their own businesses. And uh Karen Joy Fritz and I were saying, oh, go talk to I'm Karen later today. Yeah. Uh -huh. So so she went and talked to him and you know, 
<laughs> so very cool. Yeah, it was cool. That's a win and a resource, it sounds like all right. in one. Um, from the Institute for Entrepreneurship side, so we had a record number of signups for our recent venture validator, which by a lot, which wraps up today. So several of you I know in this room have been part of that. So thanks so much for engaging. Um, 2.0, which is kind of the sequel to that, begins March 20th. So a week from this coming Monday. So if you would like to continue your idea and just see it um, develop more, be sure to sign up for that. Um, for that soon. But just wanted to share that because that's going to keep them for the Institute and super cool to see some of these yeah, and definitely that as a resource. Um, you know, my, I've had my businesses for a while, but it's been really helpful to step out at like five o'clock and think about it for the first time. Be like, oh, turns out this is the customer I've been targeting. This might actually be my best customer. Completely different, right? And so it's been really helpful. So uh, even if you've had your business for a while or it's a brand new idea, it's well worth the time. There's an opportunity for a lot of um, sharing between Venture Validator and Million Cups, too, right? We've got a couple of people that are here new in a second, got to promote it, I think, in Venture Validator to have people come here to continue to learn. Yes, absolutely. Oh, and Chris had uh, put a resource up. Um, he is offering a spring special for professional head shops. <laughs> $200 per person, two poses, each in black and white and color, read touched, and high resolution, suitable for print and web. So, Chris Radliff, if you need some new headshots. I didn't know you did photography, Chris. Awesome. I found that out only like a month or two ago. I bet it's good. <laughs> Anything else? All right. Well, go team. We'll see you back here next week. Same time, same place. I'm getting confused on the queue. I know. Thank you, class. So that was good. Oh, Lena's got her. Oh, she's fine. Yep, yeah, she's fine. It was last week. Yeah, yeah, yeah.